What it really takes is a family, and we as conservatives have to fight for the family. A party that desires to lead this country must have an agenda that the American people believe helps them. What is it that we can do to keep government from growing so large? We can win this battle. Uh, please join me in welcoming our next speaker for a keynote interview. Kevin Roberts is the president of the Heritage Foundation. He previously served as chief executive officer of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, an Austin-based nonprofit and the largest state think tank in the nation. Under Robert's leadership, TPPF more than doubled in size. He also expanded the Texas think tank's influence nationwide, opening a Washington, D.C. office. A lifelong educator, Kevin earned his PhD in American history from the University of Texas. After several years of teaching history at the collegiate level, he left in 2006 to found the John Paul the Great Academy, a Catholic liberal arts school in Lafayette, Louisiana. In 2013, he resigned from the academy to become president of Wyoming Catholic College. This independent stance uh, that he led at Wyoming Catholic led the New York Times to describe the school as being full of cowboy Catholics. In addition to his doctorate, Roberts holds a master's in history from Virginia Tech and a bachelor's from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Him and his wife has, have four children. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Roberts. Thank you. So, Kevin, uh, in my opening remarks, I was talking about how the American tradition of political economy, going back to the founders, uh, largely had a, a consensus agreement on four core things, private property, economic freedom, sound money, and the rule of law. Uh, but there were also debates on other issues like trade, infrastructure, national bank, industrial policy to some extent. Uh, so I'm curious, um, you at the Heritage Foundation, you're the, the president of an organization whose mission is to formulate and promote public policies based on the principles of free, free enterprise. I'm curious in particular, what does free enterprise mean to you at the Heritage Foundation? And what are some of the historical and intellectual influences, whether they're American, Austrian, or Midwestern, thinking of the Chicago School, that shape your own views of political economy? So, Johnny, thanks for having me. It appears you wanted to start with a really simple question. That's right. <laughs> well, we'll do what we can. The, the best, thanks for, for the water, and thanks for, again for having me here. The best way to start actually might surprise some people because you're probably expecting me to, to cite some really important tome of political economy. And it's a book that I used to assign in a class that I taught regularly called American Business History. And the book is a children's book, and I'm going to recommend it to you, not because you're children, but because it's really helpful, especially as our own movement to the heart of your question wrestles with all of the aspects of that, and it's called Oxcart Man. And what free enterprise is, is represented by this wonderful story, Oxcart Man, and whichever the, the medal is, the Caldecott or the Newberry for the, the images of children's book, it won that award, and so it's very beautifully illustrated. And the point is, we number one, we overcomplicate, we unnecessarily complicate, even those of us who understand the free market, and understand America and human behavior, what free enterprise is. In particular, we, we emphasize too much the macro level components of that because I'm an Aristotelian. The macro level components of that flow from our human relationships, building families, building villages and communities. And so what Oxcart Mann really emphasizes without ever talking about Aristotle is that the trading and bartering system that predated currency in colonial America, I said predated currency. Currency was around, but it was hard to get in rural America, is what free enterprise is, that we establish independent of anything, independent of a government, independent of any regulation, the value of one good being comparable to the value of another. And if we can keep that in mind, 
and fast forward to 2022 before I return to the founding generation, Johnny, then we can remember that as our conservative movement and, and, and American policy writ large wrestles with the role of free enterprise at a time that the Chinese Communist Party is an existential threat to us, we need to remember that most importantly, free enterprise comes from the perspective of individual behavior. And so free enterprise is the ability to trade freely, assigning value to goods and services with no or very little interference from government. But I'm a conservative, not a libertarian, and I lead a conservative, not a libertarian organization. A very important distinction, which is not to be disrespectful to libertarians in the audience or my libertarian friends, but in the American system, and I'll get to the, 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 the point of, of, or your question about schools of thought that have influenced me, where we need to draw the line is where government begins to interfere with that understanding that individuals have about what the values of goods and services are. We are well past that line. Having said that, I am more of a Hamiltonian than anything, which is to say that I recognize very quickly a national security exception to the free market being an important characteristic of American conservatism. And to further that distinction, I would say that the free market and our understanding of free enterprise flows from institutions in civil society that predate it, namely the family, and namely local communities that, that we emerge there. And so in that, you probably see, to, to address your second question very directly, I'm influenced heavily by more cultural conservatives like Russell Kirk and T.S. Eliot. I am a Burkean, happily. Hats off to Dan McCarthy and Sam Gregg for that wonderful conversation. But if you were to pigeonhole me into a particular school of thought, which I would resist, by the way, because I think no school of thought ever on any topic, including political economy, has had all of the answers, I'm a West Coast Straussian. Uh, natural law is preeminent to me. I believe that it's the, the reemergence of West Coast, West Coast Straussians, especially through Claremont, et cetera, ISI, is, is welcome. And you're probably seeing that at Heritage as well. That element has always been there, but I think now is the time to really try to put into concert all of these things. Let me finish with this point, even though it's not explicit in your question, if you don't mind. One of the things descending into tribes as conservatives does is allow us to make false choices particularly between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And one of the things I find very limiting about many of these schools, including with some West Coast Straussian friends, is wanting to have one or the other. I have always, as a historian of early America, thinking about economics, thinking about culture and society and politics, wanted to see them as resolutions of the other. That's a great, great answer. I'm wondering if we could maybe go into a little more detail on some of the... the um, challenges facing the country today. Um, there's an sort of increasing pervasive view among some corners uh, of the right, which I think you touched on a little bit, that state power is needed to confront some of these generational challenges, China, big tech, breakdown of the family, woke capitalism. I'm curious, um, where do you draw the line? What, obviously, this is all operating within constitutional principles, mm. the principles of social compact theory, natural law, where do you draw the line and, and how do you think about positioning heritage to address, address those challenges in a particular way? Perhaps maybe you could start with big tech since you've, um, that was one of your first initiatives mm -hmm. at Heritage, but perhaps talk on other things like the CHIPS Act, which um, I know has been debated this past week. I understand there's been a bit of a controversy. I know. I <laughs> Maybe some people in this room have something to do with that. Sure. Yeah. So on, on big, and all that conversation is very good and healthy. On, on big tech, which I think is an illustrative example, many people, including our economists at Heritage, see the big tech problem as one that might meet the criteria of a monopoly. In fact, I think that Google most certainly does. And as a conservative and not a libertarian, I understand that antitrust law exists for a reason. There have been a few cases in American history when our antitrust monopoly laws writ large have been appropriately invoked. And I think that they need to be invoked another time with, with Google. But as a social and cultural conservative more than anything, I see the harm of Google and Facebook and Instagram and especially TikTok because of the infiltration, really the ownership by the CCP, 
as having a much graver concern to me than even the economic one. And it is a, an effect on how we behave as humans. The self-image, this is coming from, from a lifelong teacher, including of middle school and high school kids, the problems with self-image that these platforms have for all young Americans, but especially young women. I have a bunch of sisters and a father of three daughters and one son. And so this is a big concern to me. And I think more than anything else, while the, the economic concerns ought, to, con ought to, to be motivating for us to have federal action against these companies, as Heritage has called for recently, we also need to remember, even accounting for those economics, that there are much graver concerns there. We ought to get to the point, in other words, that when we're talking about big tech, we're talking about the consequences of technical uh, apps on our human behavior. On the matter of the CHIPS Act, I think it's been a real instructive example of the national security exception mm -hmm. to the free market, and in particular, the reality that the Chinese Communist Party poses the greatest existential threat to the United States since World War II. Greater, obviously, if you think about that statement, than even the Soviet Union. And we could get into that if you want, but I'll move on to the, the comment about the CHIPS Act. We at Heritage would support what has been called a skinny CHIPS Act, where there is a desire for supporting a very stringent law that if there is going to be subsidy for American chip companies to build factories, that they must use every dollar of our precious tax dollars in America, but even proponents of a modern industrial policy like Senator Rubio observed that that does not exist. And because I am such a critic of big business, including our own semiconductor companies, there are two things that I would say. History shows that they're going to use those subsidies that they will soon be in their pockets and they will build factories in China. And I think even for proponents of industrial policy, this is a monstrosity. And not only is it $75 billion, it's now $250 billion. And in that legislation are things that contravene our very understanding of the human person. This is something that 100 times out of 100, the Heritage Foundation will oppose. We have both the burden and the privilege at Heritage of understanding the details of bills and understanding how Washington works. And both of those are terrible. And we have to do better as a movement in recognizing that if in fact we want to be articulating a national security exception for the free market, if in fact we want to be articulating a beta test for a modern industrial policy, that bill isn't it. And the second problem is that these chip companies are making tens of billions of dollars. They don't need our help. They've just invested $70 billion collectively in Texas alone. They don't need our money. Shifting gears to uh, the environment, we have a panel on conservation tomorrow. Um, you know, one, one of the ways inflation is hitting people most potently is, is at the pump with gas prices. And the Biden administration is reluctant to open new drilling in the U.S., which, it, you know, could be a potential source for lowering gas prices. I'm curious um, what your recommendations for a conservative uh, policy when it comes to the environment and the economy and energy would look like, especially coming from Texas. I'm sure you have some ideas. Sure. I, th that's a great question. In a lot of ways for me as a conservative, take my heritage hat off, although it's you know, what I'm about to say is consonant with my, my heritage role. I grew up hunting and fishing in the swamps of Louisiana and have hunted and fished in Texas, Wyoming, everywhere we've lived. We did this last week in, in Western Virginia. And the point is the greatest stewards of the environment are outdoorsmen. I mean, this is something that's not partisan. It really ought not be ideological. But because this has become a big policy question, and fittingly, this is God's first book that is nature, we really do need to do a better job messaging on this. And I would commend to everyone, if you haven't yet read it, a book that's about 15 years old or so. It's called Crunchy Cons by my friend Rod Dreher. Rod and I can have a friendship and disagree with a lot of things and do so very civilly. But I think in a lot of ways... Rod, more than anything else, portrayed two things that are really helpful for us 15 years later. The first is that it's, it's natural in how a center-right person wants to go about his or her life to treat anything that God gives us well, starting with nature. But the second thing is that when we think about our intellectual inheritance, sort of going back to your question about 
schools of thought that are influential in my thinking. Rod does a good job of synthesizing that for the movement. But to get to the heart of the policy, let me be clear about what it isn't. It's not the Green New Deal. It's not the $369 billion that Joe Manchin and Chuck Schumer agreed to two days ago. It is not reordering the economy according to supplemental sources of energy, wind and solar, which are fine by me, but they're not reliable, they're not consistent. And most of all, two things. The first is, because they're not reliable, they're not consistent, it means that humans suffer when they are artificially subsidized to be in the market. I lived through this personally, thankfully lived through it, in the winter storm in Texas two winters ago. And I don't want to over-dramatize my life. People lost their lives. They lost their lives because of those subsidies. Those subsidies put wind and solar energy in the Texas electrical grid. And when we needed 10% more energy production, we couldn't do it because the law did not allow investment there. This is why we have to be careful about subsidies. But the second is, and I'm a little passionate about this because I've spent a lot of time recently with European government officials who probably don't like American conservatism. And it's obvious to me that they endorse what we broadly define as the Green New Deal, not because they love the environment, but because they really do want to reorder power, they want to reorder capital, and on those grounds alone, we should oppose it. But it, most importantly, to sort of end this on a positive note, we need to, to really embrace our inheritance as conservatives, which is that we were the first stewards of our environment. Let's uh, talk about inflation a little bit more uh, specifically. Generally speaking, what, what do you see as the principal causes of inflation? And if we were uh, living under a Republican administration right now, to what extent would the in inflation crisis be a factor or not? Well, I'll tell you a little story. So our wonderful executive vice president at Heritage, Derek Morgan, is a great fan of, of all of the organizations represented here. And I were leaving the Capitol two days ago. We're having lunch with a member of the Senate, actually on all of these questions. And there was this camera crew out there, and you know, you never know who they represent. And I was running off to a meeting and already late, and so I was, I was more brusque than I should have been with the camera crew. But the question ended up being, what causes inflation? And so Derek, because he's just always, unf he's unfailingly polite, paused and said, when the demand for goods outstrips supply. And then as I'm brusquely, you know, walking away, the videographer followed me and said, I still need an answer. And so as I'm walking away, I said, government. And he said, that's the answer we're looking for, meaning mine. I said, so then I stopped. I said, no, he gave you the right answer. So that's the technical answer, right? But to the heart of your question, I think what is the underlying assumption? Government. And I want to be really clear. I'm a conservative well before I'm a Republican. And both Republican and Democrat administrations are to blame the last Republican administration and this current Democrat administration. And I say that as a big proponent of President Trump's policies. But we have to get out of the habit of, of spending so much and expecting modern monetary theory and or inflation to pay down that debt, relatively speaking. This is the kind of thing that as Heritage prepares for the next conservative administration, which I do think will happen on January 20th, 2025, we have to do a good job as a movement representing conservatives, libertarians, people who use different labels to say, at the very least, can we agree that we're not going to spend more money than we have? Because it really is something that has obviously created inflation, and it's something that affects, as I always like to see policy through the lens of the average American, human behavior. Americans are sp able to spend less at the grocery store, at the, at the gas pump, they're expecting their wages to go up. And inflation, the overspending in the CHIPS Act, for example, really does undermine the very good intentions of our friends on our side who want to see the American worker improve. But government spending at that rate actually undermines that. Hmm. Are there any concrete policies in the short term that could be implemented to sort of reduce the financial pressure on families? dealing with inflation, or is sort of a Fed-induced recession, uh, raising interest rates, the only medicine strong enough to get demand under control? Well, if you're going to give me the leeway to say that anything is possible politically. Anything's right possible. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's a much it. easier question to answer then. Um, the Graham-Rudman Act, uh, you know, which is... What is the, that? Yeah, I yeah, know. For all of you who are much younger than me, 1986, uh, 
I mean, I'm enamored with this because it's great law, but it's also the authored by my political mentor, Phil Graham, former senator of Texas. It, it was a, a budget constraint act, which said you don't spend more than you have, mm -hmm. which is what we have to do in our families, right? And occasionally there are exceptions to that, right? National security, economic downturns, but the point is you've got to get back to a balanced budget. And so if that were possible politically, that would be important, not just because of the mechanics of that, because government overspending is driving inflation, but also because, to go back to my very first comment about economics being best understood through human behavior, human nature, just passing that and President Biden hypothetically signing that sends a signal to Americans, and for that matter, the rest of the world, that the parties come to an end. Short of that, though, what's going to happen, and history, of course, is a great guide. I mean, this is going to happen to some extent or another, is that there's going to be a terrible combination of a recession and high inflation. Technically, we're 48 hours into that. We've probably been several months into that. I don't celebrate that, Johnny, even though it's, it's harmful for a presidential administration that I think has been harmful for the American way of life. I don't celebrate it because I grew up in a working class family that couldn't make it on the Gulf Coast of Louisiana in the 1980s, and so we had to move around the country, which is you know, very destabilizing for our country. That's what our fellow Americans are feeling right now. This is not some academic game among conservatives in this room. It is not some political game of people in, in the Capitol. This is about American lives, and we're at our best as a movement when we're talking about it that way. Hmm. Ron DeSantis in, in Florida just recently announced a new policy where he's going to be giving $400 uh, per child um, to families for back-to-school supplies. And he also declared a sales tax holiday for school-related purchases within a two-week window. Um, so I'm curious more broadly on family policy. What do you make of attempts on the right, whether it's by Governor DeSantis or perhaps Marco Rubio, Mike Lee, when it comes to uh, other family policies, what do you make of, of these types of pu using public policy to shore up the institution of the family? And, and does Heritage have a, a family policy proposal or agenda mm. that you'll be rolling out? Yeah, great question. I've spent a lot of time on that in the 25 years I've been thinking seriously about policy. And, and I'll get to the point about what Heritage is doing. Number one, we welcome the conversation. But number two, we want to do more than just have the conversation. And so while we would do more than nitpick, we might be opposed to some provisions. What we're working on, especially with the leadership of our new vice president of domestic policy, Roger Severino, is what family policy would look like. And, and I want to start with the ideal, because I think it's really important as you're thinking about policy prescriptions to keep two things in mind. The first is what I mentioned a few moments ago, which is keep the average American in mind. This isn't an academic exercise. It's not just a Washington game. It's this will affect people's lives for better or for worse. And the second thing is we, we need to remember what the politically possible is, which includes us as a movement as we're having this conversation. But uh, what we would love is a complete overhaul of the safety net system. And so we could get very excited about some of the things that Ron DeSantis has done, in particular, even the $400 check that I think went to 59,600 Floridians. Um, but remember that the philosophical basis of that, at least for us, which would be Friedman's idea of a negative income tax, necessitates that you get rid of everything else. And what we've done as, as a polis, and what we've done as a conservative movement is say, we want to do those things and not touch the safety net systems that not only are inefficient and ineffective, but more importantly, have undermined human dignity for two generations. So we have to be better. We have to be more vigilant about saying, if in fact we want to be innovative, which Her Heritage is encouraging, that we better go at least nibble in reforming these safety net systems. And so that's going to be, frankly, the quid pro quo that we're asking our friends in the movement and people across the aisle to do that. If we can get, that, get to that as a movement, then I think we ought to be very optimistic about that kind of agenda, which Senator Rubio and Governor DeSantis, among others, have been very thoughtful about. Hmm. In terms of uh, big business, generally speaking, I think one of, the, one of the challenges is that a lot of elite economic interests sort of 
are running counter to you know national interests or sort of our, our American constitutional system or the common good. You've noticed generally. that. Right, we've noticed that. <laughs> and so what I'm wondering is, one, sort of how do you think about conservative relationship with big business, given that historically speaking, that you know, they've been friends to some degree, uh, but also just you know, generally, I think with something like antitrust policy, um, you know, it's kind of the stick and not the carrot, and it's sort of you're trying to discipline, I guess, tech companies um, back into better behavior, mm. uh, both for economic and cultural reasons. But I think the ideal is probably not an antagonistic relationship between big companies and, and you know, citizens, but there ought to be some way in which even big uh, financial interests ought to be able to support the common good um, and, you know, the American citizen. So how do you see this relationship? Do, 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 you know, do we need to be a little antagonistic in the short term, or is there a way that we can actually bring a harmony to these interests? Populism runs deep in the Deep South, where I'm from. And so I've always had a certain skepticism and occasionally hostility toward big business. And it's because the history of some big business, not all, has been that they take from the worker mm -hmm. and they rape the land and then they tell us that they're Republicans or conservatives when really all they are is focused on their profit motive. And those of us with a certain understanding of Christian teaching about the nature of business know that making a profit is but one of two parts, one of two obligations that a business had, the other is toward the common good. And so I, I sort of lay down that marker to be able to say that you are 100% correct that ideally there wouldn't be any antagonism between any American and big business, but that would be incumbent upon big business to be much better when it comes to treating their workers well, to be thinking about the common good, and this is why you're getting, even in my body language, hostility toward big business at this moment, worrying about politics. How about all you do is go make a profit and worry about the common good and treat your workers well and stop politicking? And if you're the owner of an NBA team, to stop doing business, not with our adversary, but with our enemy, the CCP. I think we're going to get there. I think it's going to be, even though I believe that in most cases, politics is downstream from culture, it is going to be an example of what is an exception sometimes, where there becomes the popular will, the political will to say, you may not do that big business. You're seeing Governor DeSantis do that heroically in Florida. I think that it is a whole other set of commentary about that, but the point is it is a real model for conservative policymakers and elected officials to know that not only is that the righteous thing to do, mm -hmm. but that it's politically popular. As our mutual friend Larry Arn would remind us, always trust the American people to get it right, mm. and that's where they are. I, I like that answer. I, I'm curious. Is that the only one you like? <laughs> I like them all. They're great. <laughs> Just pick it up. You can disagree with um, it all. You know. No, no. I, I think <laughs> your answers have been fantastic. I'm, I'm curious as sort of we, we perhaps get past the midterms, as you're meeting, because I imagine, you know, head of the Heritage Foundation, you're probably meeting with a lot of big, big company, executives of big companies, you're talking with them. I mean, do you think they, do they blow easily with the wind? So, you know, if there's a big Republican victory in the midterms, if they're sensing things are going to shift in 2025, and you're in a meeting with them, do you think, you know, are they going to let up on some of the sort of the social pressure they've been putting for ex on these sort of experimental social ideas? Do you, I don't know, do you, are they reasonable? And That's a great question. And, you know, unintentionally, uh, although it would be fine if it were intentionally, you've given me the opportunity to address what I know is a misperception about heritage far less than one and a half percent of our annual revenue comes from yeah. business, corporations, period. And I could almost count, just use one hand to count the big businesses sure. that support us. And so I think it's really important to understand that when we're talking about business and the free market and free enterprise at Heritage, we're talking about the little guy. We're talking about the independent oil producer who's really been hamstrung by regulation. He's enjoying $100 oil, but he would prefer because he also loves the common good and is a patriot that that benefit. But all that to say, yes, I do meet with a few of those folks. Uh, they are disappointed that American conservatism has become so focused on what they call values hmm. because they've been captured by their shareholders. 
And what we have to do, we at Heritage in particular have to do, and we are building this capacity, is build a system where more shareholders who share our view or at least are hostile to it mm -hmm. are more vocal in those boardrooms. Mm -hmm. So that the CEOs who, I mean, they could be left of center, that's fine, recognize there's a disincentive to be articulating all of that wokeism. In fact, I think that once the midterms go well, and they will, and once 2024 goes well, and it will, that we will probably have prevailed on this issue. The problem is we have to get through the next three years. Mm -hmm. And each one of us knows, regardless of what our age is, what our grocery budget is, what our family situation is, it's a very long time to go through a difficult set of economic circumstances, mm -hmm. aggravated by big business. Yeah. And I would, I would add to your point, and this has been my experience interacting with ISI donors and heritage donors, sure. and even you know, Hillsdale donors, is that the vast majority of them, you know, it's not like we're going to American Express or these large companies getting, getting gifts. They, yeah. they really, truly are supporters, as I'm sure your own, as you said, are, are really small, medium-sized business owners uh, who just really care about the future of the That's country right. more than anything else. And That's right. Good, good hardworking people. Um, We've got time for a couple brief questions, and then we'll turn to the audience. Does that mean brief answers? To brief, <laughs> brief answers and brief questions. You'll, you'll get them. Um, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit more about China. We said you, know, you said that this is sort of the greatest military threat. Um, I think it's also, as we'll hear tonight from Ambassador Lighthizer, an economic threat to the United States. Um, I'm curious, you know, what do you think an appropriate China policy is? How should we counter the One Belt, One Road initiative? Um, where's your head on, on, on that? The key thing to do is to stop the elite capture by the CCP of our American elites. Hmm. Peter Schweitzer, a great friend of Heritage, is eloquent on this. And what Heritage has been arguing for, I, I did earlier today, shortly after midnight in a media interview, is lay out a series of steps. The first one is we forbid American investment in Chinese and CCP military companies. Hmm. Number two, the inverse no CCP investment in American military companies directly or indirectly. The third thing is we forbid full stop the CCP from buying an acre of American real estate, period. And the fourth thing, and this is where you would start to get real action because you, you'd start revealing through transparency some of the financial conflicts in the nation's capital. You forbid the CCP from hiring K Street lobbying firms to lobby members of Congress and then you also forbid members of Congress from doing business with them. We are going to do that. Heritage has, has kicked off an oversight project, which uh, as you millennials and Generation Zers like to say, is producing the receipts. And when our side's in power, soon we'll show the receipts. Last, last question for you has to do with the national debt. This is something that's a bit of a political football. It's easy, everyone blames the other side when they're out of power, when they're in power. The debt just continues to go up. Um, how should conservatives think about the debt? Are, what are the like actual, I mean, do you see it ever actually going down? I mean, it's, it's hard to even imagine that. Like, it is. How, I, I concede that readily. Done? I yeah. mean, that, and in, in my, not just life, but in a kind of policy career, either as an observer or academic or someone who's, who's now deeply involved in the policy details, it used to ebb and flow. Uh, that is both the debt, but the political ability, the political will to be able to reduce it. I still see it as a huge problem for America and America standing in the world. But most importantly, I see it as an albatross around the American family. And this is the context in which I and my colleagues at Heritage get so concerned about the level of deficit spending. We have a, a group of people, some of them conservative friends, and I, I respect this opinion, although I, I disagree with it, who say that inflation, modern monetary theory will pay that down. There's a lot more that goes into the national debt. Remember, I, the, the philosophical grounding I mentioned earlier than just the dollars and cents. It has a lot to do with our health and perceived health as a nation state, and I think that's one of the metrics of it. Great, fantastic. Well, why don't we pivot to audience questions? One thing I would encourage you to do is to download the ISI community app. Uh, that's the ISI community app, and ask your questions through there. Uh, we'll take uh, the first question through the ISI community app, uh, but I would, in the meantime, encourage you to make your way to the microphones on either the left or right side of the stage, and line up, and feel free to ask your questions. <laughs> 
Am I free to kick it off? Go for it. All right, so this is the first question from the app. Uh, as a Hamiltonian, do you think something like offshoring jobs qualifies as defense, or is that something else? That qualifies as what? Defense, the defense exception you were talking about. That offshoring jobs qualifies as defense, no. Uh, onshoring jobs would qualify as, as the national security exception, right? Very simple. Devil's in the details. All right, next question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. It seems like I do not belong here because I'm in medical sciences. I'm an immunologist and cancer and vaccine sciences. I think one of the biggest, largest economic toxicity is the healthcare system, as just was mentioned once here. Uh, <clears throat> American health status ranks last compared with other developed nations while we spend the largest amount for disease care, not for health care. Cancer has become a mystery to solve in the last six, seven decades. And uh, the reductionist approaches to uh, cancer problem, cancer biology, has been a major uh, factor in, uh, in, in healthcare problem. We have lost millions of people to uh, cancer therapy, precision medicine, uh, personalized uh, uh, the targeted therapy. And we have to really uh, think a little bit more serious about why we are doing what we are doing. Uh, the NIH, in collaboration with Big Pharma, Excuse are me. really controlling our health. What can we do, and can I help you uh, to actually do something about this? Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm sure Johnny's glad you're here, and I'm sure everyone in the room's glad you're here, so thanks for the question. The, I'll cut to the chase. The problem with American healthcare, in spite of the money we spend on it, is that too much of that money is spent on middlemen between doctor and patient. Yes. Every reform proposal, every single reform proposal, at the state level and federal level, needs to be vetted with the question, does this get more middlemen out of the way? And you're going to see the expense go down and you're going to see access to real care go up. And if we had more time, I would give you details about how at the state level in the last Texas legislative session, I was very involved in that. I don't deserve the credit for that. I'm not the policy mind, but it lets you know where the Heritage Foundation is when we're talking about this in the coming months. But I appreciate Thank your you. insight. Yes, ma'am. All right, question over here. Hi there, so I have another question from the app. Um, so someone is wondering, would you say rent seeking is the largest economic problem facing our country today? Gosh, is rent sinking the largest problem? It's a huge problem. I guess I would have to think for a minute or two if it's the largest problem. Uh, it, top three, I guess I'll say there, but I would want to spend at least five minutes thinking about is there a larger problem that I'm not thinking about, but it's a huge issue, especially in Washington, D.C. Right, another question from the app. How can the right counter the emerging ESG movement in the American economy? Great question, you know, from this, uh, this working class kid who grew up around the oil industry, and by that I mean the machine rooms of oil platforms, not the white collar side, although I'm grateful for the white collar side. ESG is also, it's, it's in essence an existential threat, not just the oil and gas industry, but more importantly to any American, including those who, for example, like wind and solar energy, and the reason is it takes away the fiduciary responsibility, the, the financial responsibility of decision makers of capital from doing what they need to be doing, which is maximizing their profit and also um, addressing the common good. It undermines the common good for that reason, 
especially when you think about the particular social agendas that are behind ESG. But to conclude on a positive note, I can report for the first time since I became aware of what ESG even stood for a few years ago, that we are, if we've not yet turned the corner on that as a movement, we're very close to doing it. A lot of people deserve credit for that. And what success will look like is not merely state treasurers saying, if you're requiring this garbage, go away. We need more of them to do that, don't get me wrong. It doesn't just look like state legislatures and Congress taking action. What it looks like is that we as shareholders or our representatives as shareholders become more vocal in boardrooms because I can guarantee you, going back to a couple of our questions about Fortune 500 companies, the vast majority of Fortune 500 CEOs just want to run their business. They actually don't want to be engaged in politics. Uh, thank you for um, the, the great uh, uh, speech that you gave there. And uh, I was wondering, so Tocqueville talks about the frontier, the frontier's impact on American society and enterprise. And Heritage has done some great work on um, Dean Chang, especially on outer space as being kind hmm. of the frontier of uh, America's next frontier and America's final frontier. But I guess it's a little bit uh, removed from kind of domestic concerns about the family and how do you match kind of the capture of the space industry by people who are interested in uh, putting jobs overseas and taking away from the American family and kind of the need to be, to, to go into space and to expand uh, our national interests in, um, in the extraterrestrial commons. So is your question about, is there a parallel between space and space exploration today being the next frontier with the frontier thesis in the United States? Yes, and also, but how do you match that with like domestic concerns? There's a um, kind of a mismatch between our focus, a lot of focus is done on like taking care of like the American family and economics. Uh -huh and trying to protect ourselves from the, um, the global market. Okay. But we need the global market to go into yeah, outer okay, space. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Now you're, you're, I mean, I love the question. I just want to make sure that I, I at least answer the question you wanted me to. In 1893, when the historian Frederick Jackson Turner arrived in Chicago at the American Historical Association and gave what remains one of the most innovative and, and influential speeches there, a meeting I used to attend regularly, although not in 1893, <laughs> he, he gave us the phrase frontier thesis. And I have thought a lot, in fact, I've mentioned it to students over the years, the timelessness of that for the United States. And so I've often been enamored with the idea, to go to the first point of your question, that space exploration is sort of that. In other words, space is sort of the frontier. And we've even used that language dating back to President Kennedy talking about the moonshot. And you probably know this, but Vice President Pence, of course, sees it the same way. He's the architect of the Space Force, which I didn't really appreciate until a few people, a couple of them associated with ISI, connected the dots for me. But I'm going to get to the heart of your question and say, well, I think, and pardon me if this isn't exactly where you wanted me to go, at the same time that we can be critics of the effects of globalization for reasons that affect the American worker and the American family, we really ought to, with responsible public spending, see space exploration as giving us at least the perspective in which our economic and human relationships exist. And so I, as a conservative and not libertarian, one of the reasons that I make that distinction often is that there is a proper role for government. And one of them, of course, I think, is to make sure that for military purposes, other purposes involving space, especially considering how involved the Chinese are, that we'd be very focused on it. So thanks for the question. Thank you. You bet. Yep. Uh, thank you for coming to speak. Uh, so you've talked about companies not being political and they're too politicized right now, but you've also spoke about the, the NBA not uh, shouldn't uh, do business with China. So I, I'm wondering if you really think that businesses shouldn't be political or that you're saying that they're taking politics which don't further the American, you know, experiment, that don't align with American ideals. I mean, how, how do businesses and people in business balance their responsibility to be a good citizen? 
and balance the responsibility to be a good business Yeah, manager. great question, and thanks for asking for that clarification because I could see how my comment would be confusing. It, it's, it's both, which will further the, con the confusion for, for just a moment. What I mean is, given the contemporary circumstances of almost 100% of American business, in fact, we just need one hand to count the exceptions to this, who are using their move into politics to advocate for politics that I presume most of us don't like, that's bad, but I also don't want to see them being really involved in politics on the conservative side. Their job is to be in business and promote the common good and certainly not descend into whatever the popular will is of the day. But the second, really the first comment that I made and, and, and the first that you did about China, what I mean by that is it's un-American, it's unpatriotic, it's unjust, it's evil for the National Basketball Association to allow knuckleheads like LeBron James to do business with factories that enslave people with a regime that is one of the most evil in history and then tell me that I'm not patriotic because I want to put my hand over my heart during the national anthem. They can go to hell. That's what we need to say. Is that clear enough? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kevin, I was texted a question about uh -oh. the CHIPS Act. I uh, want to dive a little Texted here. a question. Texted about a question. Chips Act. This is going to be rich. Uh, so you had mentioned skinny chips, sort of your diet chips, however you want to frame it, would, might be acceptable. So, so if you were able to craft your ideal skinny chips act, how would you ensure that that money is not spent in China? And I, are there, what provisions would you put in place? That's a great question, and, and I appreciate it. And uh, being someone who has a lifelong addiction to potato chips, I, I guess skinny chips could mean a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, this is what I would do. If, if I had my druthers, which, which I presume the questioner would be willing to give me for a minute, I, and I were actually writing the legislation with my colleagues at Heritage, but also friends in the movement who may support the CHIPS Act, but say, okay, we want to go see if we can get together and, and agree on something. I would say, let's try a pilot bill. I'm a big fan of this in policy innovation. The states do this all the time. Not this goofy thing where it's a pilot bill that never does anything, but there's a, there's a trigger in that pilot legislation that expands it if it works. But a pilot bill that says, let's go find the three most impoverished areas in the United States that also with their demographics and, and access to infrastructure can support a chip factory. And let's develop a public-private partnership so there's going to be federal money going into a, a county or economic development partnership. They hold the money in escrow for those dollars. I mean, I'm talking literally, like sidewalk level. This is a dollar. It is being spent locally. This is the kind of, of sorry, yeah, no. this is how stringent we have to be. And that factory is built there, and they have to stay there mm. for at least five years. And the reason I'm so animated about this is I've been duped so many times by cons Republican legislators in the state of Texas over this stuff. Hmm. And in, unless you have that kind of strict requirement in the legislation, it doesn't work. And then, as Americans and as conservatives who have disagreements about this, which I respect, we're all friends, in a year, in two years, in three years, we can see if it's working. And if it does that, then we're all in. Hmm. Fantastic. Returning to the app, another question is, is there a free market between nations, i.e., do the principles of free markets operate at the international level? Great question. I mean, I could go all academic on you and tell you why that isn't the case, but sure, I mean, they, they do. And, and really, philosophically, that's predicated upon the concept of the nation state, and the nation state at its most, uh, at, at the height of its, of its collective virtue representing the interest of the individuals and the respective political institutions doing the same. So it's possible, it has happened, we don't have that today, which is one of the reasons in the United States as conservatives we have to confront that reality and just sort of put it back in the grill of those nation states who like to tell us, you're not believing in free trade when of course they have benefited from the lack thereof for two generations. Okay, I am here to wrap up. Thank you so much, Johnny and Kevin, for that wonderful discussion. Thanks.